On this edition of Independent Sources, why is a bill that hopes to make school lunches healthier stuck in Congress? Latino arts and cultural institutions fearful that budget cuts may wipe them out. Native Americans thriving in New York City. And Mexican journalists under fire. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Viana Ravinka. And I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. The Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 has been hailed as a bill that could forever change the way American school children eat. The bill would commit an additional $4.5 billion to child nutrition programs over the next 10 years. It would establish higher food nutrition standards, expand food access to more children, and strengthen school wellness programs. Those seem like welcome ideas at a time when one in three American children is overweight. But there's one problem. The Senate version of the bill, which is before the House, will take money slated for the food stamp program to fund the healthier school lunches. This has fueled a debate that stalled the legislation for now. I spoke with public health expert Dr. Nicholas Frodenberg and Kristen Mancinelli of City Harvest about the act and its future. And uh, Nick, uh, let me start with you. Uh, right now, there's a bill in front of Congress that, you know, on the surface, we all should be happy about because it, it, it really deals with the problem of childhood obesity and, and good nutrition. So why is it stuck? Why is there a controversy surrounding such a bill? Well, I think the immediate issue is that uh, in order to uh, more adequately fund school food, uh, Congress is proposing to take some of the money to do that out of the food stamp program. And there are actually uh, many more people who need food stamps, now called SNAP, than are getting it. It's a, a very important source of support, and many more people in America are hungry now because of the economic crisis than they were before. So feeding uh, kids in school by taking uh, money away from hungry people in the other parts of the country from the point of view of uh, health folks isn't a good move on the part of Congress. Is this bill going to go anywhere? Is it going to eventually pass? And in what capacity, in what form will it pass? What is likely to come out of this? Well, I think our, uh, the hope is that, yes, that in this next week or so, the bill pass, and that we then find ways to restore the money or find some other way to uh, bring in the money. Because it is important that we expand funding for the school food program. Many of the provisions of the bill uh, are steps in the right direction. And so uh, I think the hope is to get the bill passed, and people should be calling their Congress people, <laughs> urging them to do that. Kristen, child obesity and nutrition are real problems in our, in our, in our community, in our society. Uh, what is your organization doing to address some of that problem? Well, I work for City Harvest, and we're a food rescue organization, so we distribute mostly perishable fresh food to food pantries and kitchens throughout the five boroughs. In addition to that, um, with regard to the child nutrition programs, we've been leading a coalition of groups in New York City under the New York City Alliance for CNR, or Child Nutrition Reauthorization, for the last year and a half calling for passage of a strong child nutrition bill. Um, and as Nick mentioned, there was broad support for passing this bill, which would update the child nutrition programs like school lunch, um, until Congress made a proposal to cut funding from the SNAP or food stamp program to pay for part of the bill. Um, since that happened, we've asked them to make sure they don't cut SNAP funds and still pass a child nutrition bill. Well, where, could, where else could the money come from? Well, it's funny, you know, we, we don't really get into the habit of telling Congress where to find the money, um, but the money did come out of a different program initially, and this proposal to cut funding from SNAP was a last minute change. Okay. The other question, is this a way to appease Republicans? Oh, sure. It's a, it's a, uh, a, a Republican proposal. And uh, all of us know where there's a lot of money, uh, uh, money going for the military, money going for uh, outdated weapon systems, uh, money going to uh, support corporate giveaways. A very good place to uh, find money would be to reduce the subsidies we're paying for uh, corn, soy, uh, sugar, 
to the big agricultural producers. That money would be better spent to provide healthy, nutritious foods for our, food for our children in schools. But those aren't items that are on the uh, policy agenda of Congress right now. Well, what's the likelihood of this failing if, 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 if we can come to a consensus? Uh, is this something that is, is this part of the politics as usual? There's always going to be some controversy surrounding a bill and then ultimately passes? Uh, well, I'd be interested to hear what Christian says. What I hear is people are hopeful that it will pass in the next week or two in this lame duck session and that it uh, would be an important step in the right direction to get a bill passed this year, even though it doesn't have everything we want. And then we need to look, as is always the case, to uh, expand the funding to provide even, you know, to provide more adequate coverage for feeding our children in school, as well as for uh, adequately funding food stamps or the SNAP program. Kristen? Chairman Miller of the Education and Labor Committee said that um, the House doesn't have two-thirds of the votes to pass the bill on what they would call suspension. Mm -hmm. where if two-thirds would vote for it, it would just go without any debate. So there are a lot of representatives who are loath to cut food stamps, which is money in the pockets of their constituents, to fund a child nutrition bill. Um, so I'm not sure how it's going to go or if it's going to go. Politics aside, I mean, I have two children. I mean, now they're teenagers almost. And I know the difficulty it has been to get them to eat vegetables, uh, fruits, now, how are we going to be able to do that in the schools to make sure that the peas are not yucky? How, how do we go <laughs> in, uh, around that problem? Uh huh. Well, uh, again, the proposed bill would uh, move us in that right direction by expanding at least a little bit the amount of money that's available to pay for a school lunch. Uh, there are many things we could do. Uh, here in New York, we could be making more of an effort to get uh, food from the farms in New York State. That would be good for our local farmers. It would also be good for kids. They could get uh, apples, carrots uh, delivered right to their school. Uh, and I think we also need to look at uh, one of the reasons perhaps our children uh, aren't as uh, fond of fruits and vegetables as we'd like them to be is that the food industry spends $30 billion a year promoting its most unhealthy products, mm -hmm. uh, high fat, high sugar, high salt products. So I think like other countries, we need to look to restricting that food advertising that targets children before they're old enough to make informed decisions to buy the food that will make them uh, prematurely sick, prematurely die. Uh, that just isn't right. Kristen, same question. Mm -hmm. How do we get around to this problem of getting kids to eat what's good for them? Healthier now? food. Well, one of, one of the reasons why New York City is not supporting passing the bill with cuts to SNAP is that New York City school food is actually considered a leader among school districts in really? the country for having made quality improvements to the food. Um, and in addition, we have higher standards for um, the nutrition standards for the meals. And so one of the, one of the proposals in the bill would um, elevate the standards for, for foods sold all throughout the school campus. New York City has kind of higher standards already. Um, so, you know, to get at that a little bit, there are a lot of things that are happening um, around getting fresh food, farm to school programs mm -hmm. are happening here. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's a matter of being patient with a very big system that has very little money. Um, and just to note that the money that would come in from the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act would be a six cent increase for, for lunch, for the reimbursement rate for lunch. Um, so, not, not huge by any means. <laughs> Kristen, thank you very much for being here. Nick, thanks for being here with us. Thank, thank you. you for having us. When we come back, state budget cuts raise concerns about the future of Latino cultural institutions. Before that, Abby Ishola with some other news. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. Manhattan Times reports that city council member Robert Jackson is speaking out against possible budget cuts for senior citizen programs in the city. The Department of Aging's budget for the 2011 fiscal year is expected to drop by almost $20 million from last year. Jackson says the act shows inherent disrespect for the elderly that permeates much of our popular culture. St. Mary Margaret Elementary School in the Midland Beach area of Staten Island has been scheduled to close down. This after the Catholic parish that owns the school backed out of a $1 million deal with the Muslim American Society this summer. 
The organization wanted to buy an old convent to set up a Muslim school and mosque in the area, but residents protested the deal because they were uncomfortable with the group's presence in their neighborhood. The Italian Tribune reports that many Italian Americans are reclaiming their heritage through a law that allows them to maintain dual citizenship. The Italian law, titled Jure Sanguinis, permits foreigners of Italian descent to reach as far back to their great-grandfather to qualify for Italian citizenship. The process can be difficult and take a number of years to complete, but those who regain citizenship can work, retire, invest, and study freely in Italy. They can also receive health care in any of the European Union nations. And finally, the president of Uganda has his country in an uproar over his new rap song. Washington Afro reports that President Yoweri Museveni recently released a hip-hop song and video titled You Want Another Rap? His goal is to appeal to young Ugandan voters for the country's 2011 elections. The song is reportedly on heavy rotation in Ugandan clubs and radio, yet some YouTube viewers say the 65-year-old leader should be more focused on improving the country's infrastructure. Those were just a few headlines from the ethnic media. Back to Gary and Vianora in the studio. Governor Patterson's $190 million slashing of member items to various community groups in New York has some arts and culture advocates in a tailspin. So much so that the Cultural Equity Group, CEG, has started a campaign to restore these funds immediately. The CEG says these cuts may doom not only arts and cultural institutions, but services for the elderly and other community groups as well. Some in the Latino community point to the Economic Development Corporation's recent attempt to manage more of El Taller Boliqua's theater and multi-purpose space as the most recent encroachment on these institutions. Abby Ishola spoke with Marta Moreno Vega of the Cultural Equity Group and William Aguado of the Bronx Council on the Arts about the need to protect these arts and cultural institutions. How have state budget cuts and the economic situation affected arts programs in Latino communities? It's been devastating. Uh, our groups are underfunded historically. They've been on the margin and there's always been a constant struggle to get funded. And now with these deep cuts and the um, freezing of member items uh, at the state level, our groups are in a spin. They're absolutely at risk. And Bill, what are the government and economic factors leading to the decline? Well, largely is the inefficiencies and, and, and the corruptions of our elected officials. Uh, and I don't apologize for that comment to hold our money up in Albany for no apparent reason other than to, uh, to further uh, an argument with the, other, with the other leaders and at the same time realizing the impact on our communities, our artists, our, the, the people who are informal artists, our arts organizations. What we are anchors in our community, we are we're the ones, we're the beacons, and we, we collaborate with many other institutions. People find their voice to articulate with us, and the, the fact of the matter is that there's very little attention being paid to us, very little respect being, a pay, uh, being paid to us. I do feel that ultimately it's, uh, it's criminal what they have imposed on us as a community. Okay, let's talk a bit about El Tayer Boricua in East Harlem, the community center in East Harlem. Um, recently, the EDC came in and said they want to manage part of El Tayer. How are people in the community reacting to it? Well, I know that there's a lot of discussion and there's a lot of debate on it. Uh, but again, it's the Tayer that has to speak on it in EDC. Okay, Bill, do you have anything to say about El Tayer? What's going on? Well, I was in, in Los Angeles with with Fernando, who's the director of Tayel, and he is so frustrated by this. He has just thrown up his hands and saying, you know, it's the city, once again, imposing their will. It's the local p political factions that are starting to take sides against us. And, and frankly, he says, you know, I have been doing this too long, and, 
you know, and I, would, and I was pleading with him, you got to continue no matter what. You know, it's, we can allow outsiders, politicians, to drive us out of our communities. And there's a reason why they're doing that. Why should people care about cultural centers in ethnic communities? Well, we don't look, don't look at it as a cultural center. Look at it as how do we maintain our legacies? How do we sustain our legacies? How do we remember our histories? No one is doing that. Where are our histories? Where are the Jorge Soto who passed away in 1980-something, early 90s? Who knows him? And he was a great artist in our community. How many of our artists and, and, and musicians in the 40s and 50s are just memories to families, memories to old timers. That history is not being written. That history you cannot find in a museum. That history you'll never find in the public library. Marta, why do you think people should care? Because it's the infrastructure of our communities. I mean, the cultural centers that um, sure up our, in, uh, our communities are institutions that are not only art, but they're cultural centers, as Bill has said. And our institutions work with social service institutions, social justice institutions, because culture is broad. Culture is not only the creative arts. It's how you think. It's how you move in the world. It's how you understand your history and how you understand that history informing how you move forward. And it also provides visibility that you exist. Right? In most of our institutions, educational institutions, the history of our communities are invisible. And how do young people learn if it's not by content that reflects them? So that there's no mistake that our young people are not achieving at the level that they should because they don't see themselves reflected in what they study. What's being done about what's going on right now? Well, I think that right now the battle for our institutions to stay part of the infrastructure of our communities is an ongoing battle. Um, it is extremely sad that Governor Patterson decided to freeze these uh, member items that are critical to the institution's sustainability within our communities. And also the amount of jobs that have been lost, the amount of young people that are not receiving services in the most marginal communities is absolutely inexcusable. And remember that it's not only arts institutions that are being hurt, it's senior citizen centers, youth centers, uh, AIDS programs, and uh, the infrastructure of our community is at risk. It's ready to implode. And Bill, what, what have the communities themselves, how have they played a role in the revitalization of arts in the communities? Well, in the Bronx, it's, uh, in the South Bronx especially, in an area what we call the South Bronx Culture Corridor, I mean, it has really made it a tourism d destination where, where uh, Osto's Center for the Performing Arts, Plegones Theater, our gallery, Longwood, Bronx Museum, and so many other artists who have moved into the Mott Haven area. It's made it a destination and people are starting to come, not just from the Bronx, but from tourists are coming from all over to see what, this miracle that the media doesn't cover. But uh, we get more coverage from Europe, from Asia, from South America than we do here in our own city. But the word is out there and you know it's, and people, the tourism, that comes, you know, they start, they're seeing artists, Latino artists, Puerto Rican artists, African American artists, Asian artists, white artists, all working together and taking a pride in their community. It's not about gentrification, it's about integrating themselves into the overwhelmingly Latino community along 138th Street in Brooklyn. So, yes, if you leave us alone, we, we know how to take care of our problems. If you're, going to, if you're not going to support us, then don't take credit for what we do. Do you guys plan to put pressure on the incoming governor? I've been putting pressure on every governor since I've started this job. You know, when people say, Bill, remember the good times? Well, you know what, We've, I've been yeah. at the council for 32 years and I've, I've experienced a cultural funding recession in the Bronx for 32 years. We haven't had good times. It's a testimony to the artists, to the arts organizations, to our supporters, our friends, who, may, who are supported us and we survived and continue to you know, assert ourselves and our commitment to the community, our commitment to our art form, our commitment to our legacies. 
Marta Vega and Bill Aguado, thank you for being with us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the invitation. Still to come on the Independent Sources, a look at the thriving Native American community in New York City. And Mexican journalists under fire. Tonight, we begin a new series on independent sources called Tribes of New York. Over the next few weeks, we'll give you a glimpse of cultures some have long thought dead or didn't think still existed in New York City. We begin tonight with Native Americans. When most people think of New York City's original inhabitants, the Native Americans, they think of the past. But as Marlene Peralta reports, the American Indian community is still very much alive in the city. New York City is without a doubt a melting pot. It has welcomed people from all over the world and from other parts of the United States. Regan Tarbell is one of them. I moved here with my ex-husband, who was an iron worker. So he is, yeah, he's from the community. He's Mohawk as well. Um, and he was working here, so he had already known that there was guys from the community, you know, who were staying in Bay Ridge. So it just seemed like Kind of like what happened before, it just seemed like, okay, there's Mohawks there, that's where we go. Tarbell's grandparents were among the Mohawks from the Kanawagi Reserve in Canada who came to New York as iron workers and settled in Borough Hill, Brooklyn. When you think of Mohawks in New York City, you think of them in Brooklyn. That's the way I think of it. Um, you know, with the fact that my parents were born in this borough, um, my mom lived on Atlantic Avenue, my dad grew up on Pacific Street, not far from here actually. Tarbell highlighted her family's history in a documentary she titled To Brooklyn and Back, A Mohawk Journey. They helped build the Empire State Building, Rockefeller Center, the United Nations, and the Verrazano Bridge to name a few. I heard many stories, many anecdotes. One of them is about the church behind us, the Kyler Church. It was a Protestant church, but many Catholics would go there as well because the, the priest, Reverend Corey, would give sermons in the Mohawk language. Once he realized that he had a community of Mohawk people living in his neighborhood, um, he learned the language. She's not the only one who has highlighted the presence of the American Indian community in New York City. Native peoples actually have been coming to New York City for uh, centuries. Of course, they originally were expelled in the 17, late 1700s, uh, but then Starting in the late 1800s, they started coming back on their own accord. At first, the biggest industry they worked in was showbiz. And at the turn of the century, in the early 1800s, New York was the center of the silent film industry. Brian Howard studied the American Indian community as a journalism student at Columbia University. He worked on a project created by Maureen Gugu, a project they both call Native New Yorkers. And when she came, actually, she found that lots of people on the street and in the school and pretty much everywhere she went would start speaking to her in Spanish. And then she realized that, oh, they think that I'm Latina. And she tried to explain, no, no, I'm Native American. And the most common response is that people didn't understand that. So she had to try to explain, you know, the people who used to live here before Europeans came and they were like, oh, you know, she'd get responses like, oh, I thought they all died. On the contrary, they found Native Americans are very much alive. According to data from the American Indian Community House, there's an estimated 30,000 Native Americans in the Big Apple who represent different nations. Because it turns out actually there's more Native Americans living in New York City than any other city in all of America. Some of the Native Americans Howard and his partner interviewed blamed the misinformation towards their community on the lack of education. The education system in the United States teaches very little about American Indians. They cover it in October and November, Columbus Day and Thanksgiving. And these children are brought up that way with very little education. They go on to run the country that with no knowledge of the trust responsibilities that the federal government has, no knowledge of Indian history in general, and it's not just Indian 101, what is it, 550 different nations, and they're all 550 different um, customs. Cultures, Regan says, are alive and thriving. 
just important that people realized that we are still here, that there are Mohawks, there are Native Americans, there are Crees, Ojibwe's, that we are still here and we're a very active part of the community. For Independent Sources, I am Marlene Peralta. Finally from us tonight, Mexican journalists live in a constant state of fear. Many have been murdered or harassed by drug traffickers and police officials as they try to report stories about violent and illegal practices in their country. As the violence escalates, Reporters Without Borders has been among the voices calling for order to be restored along the border. Tonight on Journalists Under Fire, Mexico's plight. <laughs> El enfrentamiento entre fuerzas federales y lo que viene siendo prácticamente alguna célula de... Mexico is indeed one of the most dangerous places in the world for journalists, uh, let alone Latin America. The journalist for El Diario, Luis uh, Santiago, who was murdered in October, Reporters Without Borders issued a statement condemning uh, his murder, in particular because he was a photographer trainee. He was only 21 years old, not yet a reporter, and was killed in a public facility, a shopping center that was very close to uh, his newspaper. The reason that journalists are being targeted in Mexico is a number, it's a threefold problem. The first part of it is drug trafficking. Felipe Calderon has issued an attack on these drug traffickers that in previous administrations with Vicente Fox and others were allowed relative liberty in being part of the community, in giving money for schools, for programs, and being allowed to trade in drugs. Uh, Calderon doesn't want this. He wants it stopped. And this is where you're seeing the influx in the past several years of massive amounts of civilian and journalist deaths. The second part of this is that journalists are covering some 90% of ammunition, small arms and light weapons that equip these drug cartels are coming from the United States. And the threefold process of this is that journalists inside the United States that may be on the Texas border the Arizona border, who are American citizens who are covering this issue, will also likely be targeted because we know that the drug trafficking uh, goes all the way through Atlanta. So it's definitely a part, an integral part of the United States. It's not just in Mexico. And we want to see that Mexico is safe. And if Mexico is safe for people, then immigration doesn't become such a big issue because people don't need to come over the border. What many people need to understand is that immigration doesn't become a problem unless people f are fleeing a situation that is too difficult to deal with. Before we go, we would like to wish you and your family a happy Thanksgiving on behalf of the entire Independent Sources staff and crew. Until next week, stay independent-minded. <laughs>